Hi, um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak about the work of artist Agnes Dennis. My name is Emma Enderby. Um, I am a curator at the House to Kunst in München, but I also curated a retrospective exhibition of Agnes's work in 2019 for The Shed, which spanned her 60 year career and was titled Absolutes and Intermediates. Um, the background on Agnes Dennis, just um, briefly, she was born in Budapest, she was raised in Sweden and educated throughout the United States. And she has participated in more than 600 exhibitions uh, worldwide, galleries and, and museums. She's 91, having been born in 1931 and still lives in New York. So, Agnes, um, she was an innovator of, she is an innovator, I should say, of several art movements. Uh, she creates work really in a broad range of mediums, utilizing various disciplines, science, philosophy, linguistics, ecology, psychology, um, really to analyze, document, and ultimately aid humanity. Uh, this was a fundamental goal of Agnes's, um, to think about how her work could um, ultimately help help us, help humanity. And she turns her analysis, these, this understanding of these different disciplines into these beautiful, sensual, visual forms that she's really developed over the course of her career. But I just wanted to start by playing a video that we made um, at, for the shared exhibition, which really introduces Agnes's, uh, Agnes's practice. Agnes Dennis is a pioneer in conceptual, environmental, and ecological art. Everything Agnes does is ambitious. She was one of the earliest artists to really think about environmental concerns, talking about things that now we are all talking about. I want to change humanity a little bit, and I think I have. My work was aimed to deal with one little problem at a time and to find benign solutions. She created hundreds of artworks, some realized, some unrealized, with the hope of helping our planet. I don't make my work for myself. I make it for humanity. So this is just also an installation image of the exhibition that we had um, at, at the shed. But as you could see in that, in that video, this through line that really takes Agnes from paper, from working on paper into the earth itself, working with earth, is this enduring, um, enduring concern for humanity. Uh, she really considers our place on this earth. Um, and somewhat with a very kind of uh, prophet-like eye to the future, um, she really was evoking our cu current climate crisis very early on, um, from the kind of 60s on. And I've just included this quote um, here, um, which says, the turn of the century and the ne next millennium will usher into a troubled environment and a troubled psyche, which Agnes said in 1990, and it feels like she really anticipated this epoch that we're now in, that we turn the Anthropocene and how our systems of behavior um, have threatened um, this planet and the organisms that, that, depend, um, that depend on it. So I wanted to start at the beginning as well, uh, the beginning for Agnes. Um, this really was a defining artwork for her. Uh, it really was the beginning that took her on this long and rich path of making a work about our environmental crisis and our humanity as a whole. Uh, it was 1968 and Agnes undertook a performative ritual which is called Rice Tree Burial. And um, it's really what she uh, states the beginning of what then became known as her visual philosophy, this taking of um, different disciplines um, and turning it into visual, visual form. But with this piece, Agnes really made a commitment to bettering humanity's future, a commitment that she has maintained throughout her career. It was in Sullivan County in New York that she planted rice. She 
chained trees and she buried um, a poem 12 feet deep into the ground. Um, it was a private performative ritual. Um, and it was through this ritual that, that she sort of embarked on, on the practice um, that we now know her for. Um, I think what was also interesting to note is that she really conceived of this work, Rice Tree Burial, at the same time that sort of American land art um, was, was taking hold, you know, Volta de Maria, Nancy Holt, Robert Smithson, among others. But I think what is very important to distinguish is this movement was concerned with creating a space um, uh, that had been traditionally been about um, working outside of uh, traditional gallery spaces and working within the land itself. However, with Rice Tree Burial, it was really more aligned with the burgeoning environmental movements of the 1960s um, and pulling this into uh, contemporary discourse. And some scholars have actually argued that this could be the first site-specific work, which is really about ecological concerns. Um, within many of these works, uh, Agnes, um, within many of the works that came subsequently and including this work, Agnes was interested in communicating with the future. And she often buried uh, time capsules. And that's an image that we see here on the right. Uh, the first one that she buried actually accompanied a second staging of this project, um, of this performance, Rice Tree Burial at Art Park in New York in 1979. Um, and as you can see from the image, the time capsule is not to be open to 2979. And um, one of the th things it contains is actually a letter addressed to dear homo futurist and a microfilm which responds, responds to worldwide questionnaire um, beginning with the question, you know, do you believe humanity will become extinct one day? Which, you know, is also the little irony that Agnes is playing with, right? This idea of if we will become extinct one day, who is going to be there to open this, open this time capsule? So you heard me uh, mentioning her visual uh, philosophy um, and she embarked sort of after Rice uh, Tree Burial on her philosophical drawings. Um, and we see three of those um, images images here. Um, it was a very ambitious uh, series of drawings, which the desire was to turn knowledge really into visual form as a means to understand it, visualizing what has never been visualized before, logic, mathematics, processes of thinking, language, time. Um, all of these became kind of drawings that Agnes embarked on. One of her first foundational drawings is the human argument, the image that you see um, on the left there. Um, and it really created the visual presentation of um, a philosophical argument. You know, other drawings included structures from theoretical um, crystallology to the visualization of mathematical structures, such as Pascal's triangle, which is the image you see um, on the right from 1973. Um, and I think the works within this series are very indicative of how Agnes continued to work, really experimenting um, with different ways of making art. Uh, two other um, important works in kind of this early body of work are her introspection works, where she invented actually a technique to create a five to six meter long X-ray print uh, which tracked humanity's evolution um, from the top one um, is from uh, that evolution that you see. So from kind of ape-like ancestors into the development of intellect, science and art. Um, and then the second one was introspection to machines, tools and weapons, which showed the technological pro uh, progress from the first um, tools made uh, into the 20th century, charting kind of the the century of weapons. Um, and this, you know, she engaged in long-term projects that often took years um, to realize um, this was one of them. Others took even longer. For example, she once uh, spent seven years reading Webster's Dictionary to create a dictionary of the concept of strength and also 16 years researching dust um, to then go ahead and publish a really confounding book on uh, the scientific data of dust um, and the history of dust. And um, it's called um, The Book of Dust. 
Uh, she was well versed in technological developments as well, um, and often understood how their implication would be applied in the future. Um, so really predicting the outcomes of emerging um, computer technologies. This is a drawing called The Matrix of Knowledge um, from 1970. Um, and it's very uncanny um, in the way that it kind of predicts a future relationship with technology. Um, and I quote um, something that she said that it was really a comment on the future computerized world of censored knowledge, a predictable result of increasing specialization and information overload leading to undue condensations, generalizations, or the elimination of important information dehydrated and coded for storage to be hydrated for consumption at chosen levels. And that's a direct quote by Agnes speaking about um, computers. And I think that there's a few key words in there, right? Um, increased specialization, um, inf information overload, um, elimination of important information. I think something that um, we all know all too well in this current moment where, um, where fact and fiction are blurred and what is given to us as information and not is um, very calculated. So really, I think few could have imagined what um, intercommunication between computers and the world would really ultimately um, yield. Um, but yet Agnes really kind of speculated this future. Um, and I'll use another quote here that she wrote about this work that a youth of the future might uh, receive abridged and pre-selected educational material. Abridgments and reductions will appear at the pressing of a button on the system of an analyzer, decoder, or computer. War and peace may be reduced to a succinct paragraph, if not uh, eliminated altogether to appear only as a title under the heading Russian write writers and their work. Um, another very um, important work of this period by Agnes was The Human Dust from 69, where um, it is a sculpture which contains human remains, human bones, along with a text description that um, discusses this person's life. And I think what's interesting about this is that through, um, through numbers, through events, Agnes was almost seeing how could you quantify, how could you think about a life in these terms. And it really charts, you know, how many coffees this person um, drank, how many jobs this person, um, how many times this person went to the toilet, um, et cetera. So really quantifying kind of a human existence um, with this sculpture, very, um, very iconic work of Agnes's from this period. The next body of work um, that I'm gonna discuss is the I uh, isometric map projections. They were made between 1973 and 1979, um, really another seminal work by Agnes. Um, and these are very complex and captivating works where uh, she used isometric project projection, which is the method of representing three-dimensional objects as two-dimensional technical sketches to allow her to kind of maintain the Earth's dimensions while mathematically distorting into various forms. Um, so in doing so, Agnes really accurately transforms the earth into shapes like the pyramid that you see here or the donut, but other shapes included um, an egg, a cube, a snail, a lemon, um, even a hot dog. Um, for Agnes, uh, the series really served as an allegory provoking questions about the nature of fact and fiction, um, in our lived um, in our lived reality. Um, and I'll just again quote something she said about this body of work. Um, quote, map projections creates sculptural form in celestial space and presents analytical propositions in visual form. Map projections is sculpted reality based on conflicting and interdependent elements of art and existence, illusion and reality, imaginary and fact, chaos and order irrationality and reason. It projects a dynamic world of rapidly changing concepts and measures where the appearance of things, facts and events are assumed manifestations of reality and distortions of the norm. Obviously things that I think are highly relatable um, in our kind of contemporary current moment. 
Um, as mentioned, these are some of the other map projections, the hot dog and the, and the snail that you're seeing. Um, and I think perhaps it was more than a coincidence that Agnes actually embarked on her map projections in 1973. It was a year um, after one of the first images of Earth was ever taken in its entirety known as the blue marble. Um, the image that became one of the widest circulated images in history uh, was captivated by the was captured by the crew of Apollo 17. And it was released during a time of this kind of burgeoning environmental activism in the 70s and became a real symbol for the movement, kind of Earth as this fragile, delicate, bounded beauty. And Agnes here with this work presents us with uh, the beauty and fragility of the earth, but through its distortion goes deeper into its mathematical reality, um, its dissection of line and, line and form. Um, and again, to quote Agnes as she writes on the series, uh, the live skin of the globe is peeled, the dynamic mantle stripped bare to expose the membrane of grids and coordinates down to the core of gravitational mass, the nucleus. So the um, next body of work um, I'm going to mention is uh, the pyramid series. Um, and really the future care for humanity of the earth really shaped this, this body of work, which began in the seventies um, and is ongoing and deals with environmental philosophical concepts as a mathematical framework involving probability uh, theory that yields a flexible, expansive systems of pyramid forms. Um, so within uh, numerous of these drawings and sculptures, the artists use these structures, um, not only pyramids, but also other forms to expound on humanity, architecture, mathematics, history, and environmental concerns. And as um, Agnes explains, Pyramids weave, and I quote here, pyramids weave in and out of my work from the very beginning in diverse forms dealing with a great variety of issues and importance to humanity. Um, and it really includes a number of these meticulously, meticulously hand-drawn works. Um, this series is, is in very impressive for its geometric precision without the use of computers. Um, the depth of the vision in Agnes's uh, unrealized or better described future works is embedded in this iconic series. So within the pyramid series, there's a subgroup of drawings known as the future city, which is really this fantastical yet possible future world that Agnes was mapping out through architectural forms relating to the pyramid. Um, and at the shared exhibition, uh, one of the floors was completely dedicated to this um, pyramid series, this, um, as well as the future city. So within the pyramid series um, and the future city, uh, she drew these kind of very beautiful, compelling jewel-like works, often made with ink on fine paper, but they're actually these architectural plans, as I mentioned, for future cities to be able to cope with impending ecological stress. And again, to quote Agnes, they are created for a different world in which the inhabitants will live in space, hovering above earth or else live on earth in self-contained environments. These structures, a little of science fiction about them, rather they are pure technology with um, yet another kind of perfection, that of the flexibility of, of natural forms. So some of these are, um, Earthbound, uh, you see the egg pyramid, the future uh, future city, self-contained, self-supporting city dwelling um, from 1984, which is the image on the right, which to quote again, Agnes is designed to house and completely sustain its inhabitants, providing food, education, healthcare, entertainment, and other needs. And then there's also one she designed for the water. Uh, that's the floating water habitat, the flying fish pyramid you see on the left. And again, to quote Agnes, the fish py pyramid is a resilient and versatile water habitat, a floating city that supports life on or underwater as either becomes necessary. Uh, another exists in outer space, the half bird flexible, st uh, flexible uh, space station. And quoting Agnes, she wrote of this work, 
with flexibility, self-regeneration, and easy to repair units of modules resembling natural forms. <clears throat> Another example um, is the teardrop monument to being earthbound, which was a drawing she made in 1984. And at the shed, we commissioned a model of this drawing, and that's what you're seeing on the left. Um, in this design, the city is a teardrop floating above its base, held in place by an electromagnetic field, you know, like architect Buckminster Fuller's Water City Triton, or the floating cloud city in George Lucas's Empire Strikes Back, Agnes's new architecture plan for a distant future seems relevant to a more immediate reality. I was actually reading just one example in South Korea in the city of Busan, where the UN um, and Oceanic X have signed a historic agreement to build the world's first sustainable floating city prototype. And the project is to be realized off the coast of Busan, um, a city with 3.4 million residents. So like Agnes's uh, future city, this city is devised to withstand natural disasters like floods, tsunamis, hurricanes. And to quote uh, the executive director of the UN Habitat, Sustainable floating cities are part of the arsenal of climate, climate adaptation, strategies available to us. Instead of fighting with water, let's learn to live in harmony with it. We look toward the development of climate adaptation and that nat natural based solutions through this floating city concept. So again, it feels like Agnes um, was ahead of her time in thinking about the idea of the future city um, being on the sea, living on land and living in space. Also for her exhibition at the Shed, we commissioned another model from the future city, which is based on one of her drawings model, uh, the, sorry, the, the drawing is called Probability Pyramid, Study for Crystal Pyramid. Um, and it's a sculpture uh, that consists um, of a number of uh, translucent bricks. And we made a model of this where we created one with 6,000 semi-translucent bricks um, glowing and lit from within. Um, and sort of both works, both this and the teardrop uh, are designed again, as mentioned, as these sort of self-contained environments conceived for this, for this future. Um, but also something that Agnes did um, was often embed scientific uh, discoveries or into the works themselves. So what you see here is the, um, the probability pyramid and the curve that you see, it's not a straight pyramid like an Egyptian pyramid. It has this curved sides, which is based on um, uh, a mathematical equation of prob probability. And so embedding that into the work gives that, um, that knowledge for future generations as well, embedded within the architecture itself. The living pyramid um, is, again, another example of, of one of these types of pyramids with the probability curve. Um, it was first uh, created for the Socrates Sculpture Park in 2015, then Document 14 in 2017, and most recently in Istanbul, um, for which I'm giving this presentation, the Garden of SSM. Um, beautiful example um, located, located in Istanbul of this idea of the future city. And in all of these locations, Agnes uh, worked with local communities and sourced local flora for her living pyramids in Istanbul, consists of this beautiful wooden uh, uh, stepped terrace uh, filled with four tons of soil. And the pyramid stretches about nine meters into the sky. And the terrace of the pyramid includes over 2000 plants and flowers consisting of 600 different species that were specifically selected uh, by Agnes uh, from the kind of more urban uh, f flora of, of Istanbul and planted again with the, with the community. Um, this new architectural plan, this self-contained environment, um, you know, as Lucy Lepard wrote, um, is models and metaphors for a drastically new urbanism. And, you know, one other function of the living pyramid, you know, it's at once this monumental sculpture at environmental intervention, um, because it can be a vertical solution for, for growing food. 
in Istanbul SS um in at oh sorry um in Istanbul it is installed with uh, Agnes's manifesto uh, that she wrote uh, at the end of the 69th 1970 um which it's a very important manifesto that really uh, speaks to the commitment of Agnes's work. And you see when you read the manifesto, how it threads through everything she, she's done. Um, just to highlight a few things from the manifesto, visualizing the invisible, communicating the incommunicatable, uh, seeing in new ways, being creatively obsessive, beauty and provocation, reasoning, so many aspects of her manifesto um, really are embedded in the way that she works. And I encourage everyone to take a moment to, to read it as well. You can find it on online, but it is, um, as I mentioned, installed with the pyramid in Istanbul as well. So one of the images or one of the works um, I think that has been most uh, seen of Agnes is, is, is her wheat field, a confrontation from 1982. It's really entered the canon of works that have inspired change in attitudes towards the environment. When Agnes was initially invited by the Public Art Fund to realize an artwork in public space in New York, she decided that she did not want to create just another public sculpture and proposed planting a two acre wheat field in downtown Manhattan on a then landfill. Uh, it was a dumping site uh, for the World Trade Center construction debris, which is today Battery Park. Um, and for Agnes, this site was really non-negotiable. Um, the site for her wheat field needed to be near Wall Street at the foot of the World Trade Center facing the Statue of Liberty and on land worth billions of dollars. Uh, this for Agnes was the paradox. Um, a large golden field of grain on this expansive real estate, the, actual, the actualization of commodity that is traded on Wall Street and the line drawn between the city and the rural countryside that maintains it. So there you see Agnes herself in her wheat field, a very iconic image. And the image on the right is an aerial view of the wheat field on the, on the landfill. So the project was a comment on the mismanagement of world hunger, food, waste, energy, commerce, trade, uh, land use and economics and the environment more generally. Um, with Wheatfield, um, uh, she you know, actively um, was thinking about going against a system and I quote, wanting to draw people's attention to having to rethink their prioritize their priorities and realize that unless human values reassured the quality of life, even life itself was in danger. And as the title suggests, we feel a confrontation. It was a confrontation. Uh, the play on our lived realities. You have the vert um, vertical nature of the wheat against the soaring skyline, um, the pastoral against the cosmopolitan, uh, the, uh, uh, the rural with the urban, the commodity of wheat as this tangible reality, not only traded virtually, um, right next door to this wheat field. And as our historian, our historian Caroline A. Jones writes about the wheat field, um, our Eden fantasies um, are given to the divine given useful earth mythos of unending extraction, techno scientifically enhanced fertility and limitless human growth. So this was not the only major public work that Agnes made. The other is here, what you're seeing, um, which is Tree Mountain. Again, it addressed Earth's urgent needs. Um, it's located in Finland. Uh, the full title of this monumental work is Tree Mountain, a living time capsule, 11,000 trees, 11,000 people, 400 years. It was created between 92 and 96. And the project was first announced on World Environmental Day at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro 
following an, an invitation by Finland's Ministry of the Environment and the United Nations Environmental Programme to realize um, Tree Mountain as part of Finland's efforts to confront the alarming reality of climate change. It was built on an abandoned gravel pit um, and it really was a historic intervention to invite an artist to actively restore a piece of misused land. So take something that um, had been uh, turned for industrial reasons into um, something that was not fertile and turn it back again into a forest. Um, and Agnes chose to plant the 11,000 trees in this mathematical formation that relates to the golden ratio becoming for the artist a time capsule. So back to this kind of idea of the visual memory of scientific discourse that we were talking, that I mentioned with the pyramid is reflected again in Tree Mountain. Um, and again, it forms a type of pyramid form. So Agnes, once again, uses the land to preserve the now and to create messages for the future. Um, and I have another video actually to share um, of the documentary that was made around the realization of Tree Mountain that was filmed in 1992. <laughs> Both the children and the trees are our home. After the planting is completed, the Tree Mountain project will continue until all the trees are planted. I love that moment when she says, good luck, little tree. Um, I think just shows us how Agnes is really constantly reminding us that we are bound to this earth um, and with it comes the responsibility of this duty of care. Um, I'm gonna finish just by talking about some of her unrealized projects. Um, she has a profound and rich and endless archive of unrealized projects. Um, there's a great book, um, The Human Argument that you can get, which really charts many of those. And they're often environmental and humanitarian in focus. And just to give you a very broad overview, it ranges from analyzing cloud formations um, and a method to remove methane by using algae. Um, some of these projects, of course, were ahead of their time, for example, she wrote about designing rooftop gardens and solar environments um, that she anticipated and even proposed the use of toxins to break down garbage into glassy rock, noting uh, the available technology was here, but yet not yet financially feasible. Um, some of her uh, unrealized proposals relate to very specific commissions. Um, such as a 10,000 acre wildlife preserve and research center in Columbus, Ohio, commissioned by the International Center for the Preservation of Wild Animals in 92, where she designed a duck pond that would be uh, used um, water traps um, for the um, landfill. There was the uh, another design she made for the North Waterfront Park um, in the late 80s, which was to transform a 97 acre um, landfill in Berkeley, California into a luscious park with tiny windmills um, generating electricity. 
Um, and she wished, and I quote, for the park to be an expression of human value and our sense of responsibility each to each other and the planet. And then there's two proposals here um, that you can see on the, on the screen. Uh, one on the right is the Barrier Island and Megadunes from 2013, um, which were inventions by Agnes within the land and interventions that directly respond to pressing environmental concerns. Um, it was conceived right after Hurricane Sandy hit New York in 2013. And she designed these mega dunes and artificial islands that would really help to protect the city's coastline. Um, some have been actually discussed um, by the government as well to see if that would be possible. Um, and actually the push uh, for Agnes to work in this way, to take misused land um, to help turn it back uh, into something that would help us and help nature and humanity hasn't stopped. And so this is an active project of Agnes's that you see the image on the left. It's called A Forest for New York, which she originally began in 2014 and is still ongoing and it's to turn a landfill that actually is in Queens into a park for all New Yorkers. And this is a design, a model that we made to reflect that design. It's still something that she is actively pursuing um, and I imagine will we'll continue to do so. So thank you for listening. Um, just a short introduction to the work of Agnes, uh, Agnes Dennis. I hope you um, get a slice of who she is and how she works and just how curious uh, she she has always was and has remained um, and how she kind of continuously expands the scope of her work across ideas, forms and processes to reveal this very uh, prophetic vision of humanity. Um, a vision, I think that what's important about her work is that it shifts between melancholic and the hopeful. It's always about helping and thinking how um, it is possible to help the future, that we mustn't have an um, apocalyptic view, that there are things that we can do, that we can invent, that we can change our ways of living, living together and living with nature that will ultimately help us. And I think that's a very important part of Agnes's work, that the hope remains. Um, thank you, thank you very much.